Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Ham Exposition, Ham Exposition New England Aries Academy webinar series. I'm Steve, WA1EYF, located in Amherst, New Hampshire, the producer of today's session. Your presenter today will be George Blakesley, N1GB. George has been a ham since 1967. And his interest in digital communications began with the early personal computers in 1979. He began using FL Digi in 2008 to chase DX with PSK31. Presently, George is the net manager for the New Hampshire HF Digital Net and the New Hampshire Hospital Amateur Radio Project Net. Both nets makes extensive use of FL Digi suite of digital communication tools. His topic today will be getting started with NBEMS. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A box at the bottom or top of your Zoom screen. We will address all questions on the topic at the end of each section to avoid disrupting the flow of the webinar. Please note that the chat has been disabled. Thank you for attending. It's all yours, George. Thank you, Steve. And good morning, everyone, especially if anyone's in from the West Coast, you've, uh, you've gotten up early. I want to thank you for joining this uh, workshop this morning on the narrowband emergency management system. We'll bring up that slide here. All right. And uh, there's my email address if after the presentation you have further questions you'd like to contact me with, and we'll try to make sure that we get you up and running on uh, NBEMS. I want to thank uh, Phil Temples and the Ham Expo organizers for inviting me to give this workshop this morning. And I certainly want to thank Steve Nelson for serving as my producer. We've uh, worked together all week and especially the last two days, making sure that this will run as smoothly as possible. So let's, uh, let's see how it goes. So the narrow band emergency messaging system uh, is a digital communication system. It has a a digital engine, and then several message handling components that make it possible to transmit uh, uh, audio signals as characters over the internet and also then over the HF. This particular workshop is going to be aimed at beginners, that is those hams who might be considering whether or not to get into digital communications, those hams who are new to NBEMS, or of course, to anyone who would like a little refresher and to check back on the basics of the operation. If you have interest in more advanced topics, uh, again, contact me offline direct and we can try to see how we can assist you with more advanced features. So today we're gonna to deal with, uh, with two things um, in two parts. The first part's gonna be on getting the digital engine, fast light digital engine, FL Digi, uh, installed and running on your PC. And in the second half, we'll talk a little bit then about what is uh, for you in digital communications and especially for emergency communications. And we'll then introduce two message handling uh, components of the FL Digi suite of tools. At the end of each uh, hour, we'll stop, uh, pause and take some questions, clarify anything that we've discussed at that period of time. The narrowband emergency messaging system has uh, three components that need to be set up and made to work together. The first is you need a personal computer and on it install the uh, FL Digi suite of tools, which for purposes today will consist of FL Digi, which is the modem application, FL Wrap, a small tool that operates in the background, FL Message, which is a forms handling, particularly the ICS set, the, uh, the American Red Cross set, and the standard radiogram, and FL AMP, which is a amateur multicast broadcast tool that uh, has some advantages on HF uh, in terms of getting messages through with the least amount of having to repeat with fills. The second component is some form of sound card interface between your computer and uh, your radio. Typically that would be a, an accessory component like a rig blaster or what I'll be using is the signal link. 
Some of the more modern radios, of course, have the sound card interface built right into them now. And of course, you need a radio, whether it's HF or VHF, preferably one of the more modern ones that have digital uh, port into which you can uh, send the interface signal. If not, they can also be made to work through the microphone jack with some care. I will mention that um, the FL Digi suite of tools operates on all the major platforms. It'll also operate on Mac and Linux. I'll be using the Windows version, however, today. So we're gonna start with FL Digi. This is the engine that makes the whole thing work and you need to get it set up and running before anything else can happen. It's a computer program, which is specifically designed to take text uh, from your computer and convert it into audio signals, much like uh, teletype would do in, in the older times of ham radio. It operates in conjunction then with a radio uh, by way of the interface that I mentioned before. It's multi-mode and as you'll see uh, in a moment, once we get it set up and operating, uh, it can be used for all um, a great many of the forms of digital communications that takes place on ham radio. As Steve mentioned in my introduction, I began using FL Digi actually as simply a modem tool to operate PSK31 and to chase DX. So it has a lot of functionality above and beyond what you might use it for in emergency communications. The goal of today's first hour is to equip you with the skill set you need to get FL Digi downloaded, set up with your hardware, and understanding how the hardware components interact, especially by way of sound, in order to get a signal out on the air and, of course, to receive one. If you don't already have FL Digi, it can be downloaded from one of two locations. <clears throat> Dave, W1HKJ, is the lead project uh, director, and he maintains a website. And I'll bring that up for you here. If you go to this uh, W1HKJ.com files, you will find then he's got subfiles for each of the tools, and we would want FL Digi. So you would click on FL Digi. And you can see then here on the, in the directory, all the different versions. If you're a Windows users, you would download the setup.exe. Mac users would either, would be doing one of the <coughs> DMG file uh, downloads. And of course, um, Linux would be the tar.gz. You can also, however, get the same files from SourceForge. They, they mirror them there. And SourceForge looks like this. Sometimes when FL Digi has been updated, one of the sites will have, usually David's site will have the more recent version. Again, you get the folder, so you would go to FL Digi and you would find again, the various files that are available on SourceForge. I find his personal website to be more up to date with uh, files you would want to have. So you would download the file and then to install it, simple double click on it, or of course, right click and choose install. I would point out and recommend that when you get to the install feature that asks you if you want to create a shortcut that you do so. Uh, not critical for basic operation, makes things easy, but it also would become very useful if later on you decide to go into more advanced features such as multiple instances, in which case you're going to need that desktop icon, uh, uh, that uh, shortcut on your, on your desktop. So we'll assume uh, for practical purposes that you do know how to download files and install them on your computer, and now we're going to get to once you've got it on your computer, how do you make it work? So the first thing is you got to set up your equipment. As we've mentioned at the outset, you have three components, hardware-wise speaking, and then the software runs on the PC part. So you need a personal computer, you need an interface, you need a radio, and you need connections between the two. I'm using today the FT897. It has a data port in the back. 
I'm using my signal link as the interface. And so there's a data cable that comes from the signal link to the radio. And I have a Lenovo uh, Windows 10 PC. And there's a USB cable that runs then from the signal link to the personal computer. When you plug it in, you'll get the plug and play dialog that indicates it's uh, loading and, and configuring the necessary driver. And when you're finished, you're gonna end up with um, a sound card option in your sounds uh, control panel known as an audio codec. And we will show that in a few minutes. So this is my setup. Radio, FT897, signal link component. There's a USB cable coming into my PC and I've got FL Digi set up and running. Once you're ready to go, we're ready to see if we can make it work. So you would go to your desktop icon, double click on FL Digi. The very first time you operate it, launch it, you're gonna get the configuration wizard. We're gonna go through configuration to some extent here in the next uh, hour, but it doesn't hurt to do at least the first two of these because you need to do them in order to get various things like your macros running properly and to set up your audio devices. So recommend uh, at least those two. Whether or not you want to control your radio will depend on a number of fast factors and it's a bit of an advanced topic and I'm not going to deal with it here in this hour this morning. So up comes the initial uh, operator information, put in your call sign name, location, antennas. If you're using this for DX purposes and some of the macros we'll talk about, we'll make use of this information to automatically populate communications, reducing keyboard operations. This configuration uh, menu is accessible from the program. We'll show that shortly. This is a slightly older version of it. One of the things you'll need to get used to with FL Digi is they're constantly updating it, making it ever more useful and functional, but in the process, they often change the, the user interface outlook. This is a slightly older version and I will show them the more recent one. Has all the same information, just laid out a little differently. Second thing then is to connect it to your sound card. And that's done by way of selecting a capture and a playback option. When you click on this, you're gonna get a drop down. And the drop down is going to show you your sound cards. For capture, which is coming into FL Digi on your computer, obviously the sound is going to come in through a microphone. You're looking for the one that says USB audio codec. Assuming that uh, the, the signal link is the only audio sound card plugged into your computer, it will be the only one you see. And it may or may not have a number associated with it, which would be its port number. Playback, that is transmitting, your signal is going to go out through speakers. And in this case, you're going to look for the USB audio speaker codec. Kind of have to get your head wrapped around this in terms of what's coming which way. Once you've done that, as I said, those are the two key components to getting this thing working. The program will launch, and you'll get the standard. Uh, dashboard, if you will, or operating display. And before we go into a live uh, look at the operating display, let me point out a few of its uh, key features. You have a menu bar at the top. We'll come back later to this. The op modes are where you choose which kind of uh, signal you're going to be putting out on the air. There are things you've heard of probably uh, PSK. I've mentioned PSK 31 already. There's PSK 63. Those are common on DX. And then these PSKs are much more common in emergency communications on VHF. We've got Thors, we've got Olivia's, we've got MFSKs. These are all modes that you would choose by way of this dropdown. We're definitely gonna be using the configure menu because there's a, a bunch of additional features we may wanna set up. They're not essential unless uh, 
uh, there are problems and frequently they're more a matter of user preference. We'll be talking about RxID, your receiver ID and your TxID as we get into actual transmission of signals and how those can be useful to keep stations uh, coordinated with one another. It helps to be able to tune your, your system and your toggle button to tune the radio once you have it working is up here in the upper right corner. This area right in here may or may not be functional. It, it is optional. Obviously, if you have rig control, you'll be getting your actual frequency. You can manually put in the frequency if you don't have rig control, just so you're logging perhaps, if you're gonna log through this uh, is appropriate, but it's not essential. This band in here, I happen to put mine in this region. It, there are also options to put it down here or down at the bottom. These are called macros and we'll deal with those. Those are canned transmissions, uh, text that you've already typed and you just one click will send the, the message out. This region is the transmit pane. When you are window, sub window, when you're transmitting, you'll see what's going out over the air populating in here. Uh, and this is also then the receive area when your signals are coming in. When you wanna type something live, it goes here. Macros will populate it and then send it. Um, some of the forms handling tools do not do that, will not put it in here. They'll go straight to this pane here. This down here is the waterfall, or in this case, I've got it set up to look at the signal waveforms. And I've done that on purpose for this demonstration because how you set up the amplitude here is often critical to how well the signals decode. Your mode that you happen to be on will be showing in the down in the lower corner where you are on the waterfall. Um, and I'll show it on the live one in a moment is here. Generally speaking, we speak uh, in NCOM of where am I gonna be on the waterfall in, in Hertz and 1500, for instance, is a common one. We're pretty close here. This has got a little off frequency, 1496. Um, some optional kinds of buttons, automatic frequency control might be necessary with some modes because stations might be a little off frequency and you gotta watch out, you don't drift. You can lock your transmit frequency. Um, there's a squelch option. And this partly hidden there is the transmit receive manual toggle switch. That, uh, if you wanna type some text and then transmit it, you type and then click when it's finished, you click again to toggle it. And this is signal strength meter right here. So let me bring up a live uh, window. So right now I've got uh, my signal link and, and FL Digi connected to my FT897 and I'm monitoring 20 meters. Typically that's uh, 14070. And I'm doing that so we could perhaps demonstrate uh, some reception of PSK31 signals. You see down here in the bottom, PSK31. And why am I not getting anything happening here? Let's get a stronger signal. This is the waterfall. PSK31 are fairly narrow signals here. And I'm not getting a decode here. Why am I not decoding? Is it because I'm down too far? There we go. So, this keeps a transcript of, your, of what's been going on. Actually, we ran the digital net this morning, so I've got quite a bit of transcript in here. And I've already captured it. So you have the option to clear these windows at any time. A right click will bring up some choices and there's a clear button. You can set your cursor on a, on a signal. Now, I wouldn't wanna do this chasing DX. I've locked my transmit on 1500. Uh, I would be operating split if I, listened on this. So I'm going to turn that off. See the little green dot went away. And now we're here. If I turn it back on, the green dot's here. So this is PSK31. It's very narrow, very slow, but very robust. Uh, not generally used in uh, NCOM communication, but I'm using it on 20 meters because that's typically what you're going to, uh, I was going to be able to find for you this morning in order to show it. Now, on my um, slide, I showed the signal mode and that's down here in the lower left corner. Two clicks brings me to it. 
And what's important about it is that it has upper and lower limits and you don't want your signal being much outside those limits. Otherwise it starts to clip and it may not be decoding properly. And um, we'll talk about how you could set that in, in just a moment. So hopefully after you did your install, you uh, typed in your user information and set the sound card and launched your program, you're seeing this. In that case, you, you got a good start. The question of course is whether or not you get a transmitted signal out. If you're not seeing this or it's very pale or it looks something like that, it means then that the audio is not getting from the radio to the FL Digi and we need to work on what might be causing that. The first thing you might do is adjust your signal link, which I can do here and bring it up a little bit. So what are we talking about here? This is the magic that makes it all happen. And if you're not having luck initially, it's gonna probably have to do with your sound card interactions. You've got the radio, you got the sound card, you got the computer. The computer and the sound card need to set their levels properly so that the signal will neither be too soft or that is too low or too strong. And you have got to get under the hood a little bit and it never hurts to explore with this in any case. And most beginners, if they're having problems, it usually lies in this area. So for your receive, you're gonna to wanna to go to your lower right corner of your PC if it's a Windows and right click on the speaker icon and get the dialog for your sound control panel. You can either go through sound settings or sounds and you're gonna to get to the sound control panel. It has two, it has a set of tabs across the top. Now remember, to get this audio into your PC, it needs to be hearing it. So it needs to be recording it. And so we're gonna be setting the microphone levels. You're gonna get a list of all your sound cards that happen to be present. I have a flex uh, radio, so I've got quite a few uh, digital audio exchange sound cards, but what you see, the key one to look for is the one that says USB audio codec microphone. When you found it, you highlight it and you click properties. And you go in the properties to the levels tab. And now there's gonna be an interaction between the level you set here, excuse me, the level you set here, the level you set here, and what it looks like on your FL Digi. So as just as I was doing before, you wanna be playing with it live while you watch your FL Digi control panel. So let me bring that back up. So there's my FL Digi and here's my sound control and I'm on my USB audio codec. So I go to its properties and its levels. And uh, just to demonstrate it, <laughs> if I hit mute, You muted the computer. Whoops, am I okay now? You're fine now. Okay, <laughs> interaction here with multiple sound cards. Okay, well anyway, this level can be used to set your receive level. And at the moment, the passband's not very strong signal, so you boost the level up. Again, keeping things within the, mostly between the limits is the key to this. So that when we go to our signals, we get a good solid yellow signal. And you will talk about the coloring here as one of the options you can play with later on. And now it's decoding again, the way we want. So that is the proper means of setting your uh, audio input to your FL Digi. There is, I said before, then this interaction between the, let me just close this for a moment. There's an interaction between the sound card, the signal link, which I didn't have to touch in this case. I had the setting set at uh, nine o'clock. So this particular diagram shows it a little high in order to get then the boundaries in between. 
The same thing can be done for transmit and probably needs to be done for transmit. Same uh, initial process, right click on the speaker icon in the lower right corner, go to your sound settings, and now you're gonna be dealing with your speakers. That is the output from your computer going to the sound card. So I bring back my sound card, I switch to playback, which is another category, and I find my speakers and I go to their properties. And again, I check their levels. Now, this uh, requires that you have your radio on hand because now we have an interaction. I'll bring it up here. We have the signal link and we've got the speakers and it's gonna affect your RF power output. Unless your radio can operate at full duty cycle, that is at its full rated power 100% of the time, and most radios don't, you'll wanna make sure that you set your power output of your radio at 50%. So the typical 100 watt radio, as you adjust your speaker amplitude and your uh, signal link control, you wanna make sure be watching your radio's power. Well, of course, you'll have hit the tune button to start the tuning on the radio. And then you keep an eye on it. Of course, you don't have to operate at the full 50%. You could operate less, and a lot of people like to operate in the range of 30 to 40 watts. Or, of course, if you're a QRP aficionado, you'll, you'll set it even lower. But there's a three-part interaction. If you cannot get the signal link and the speakers to keep the power under 50%, your radio may well have one way or the other, it does, either as a menu or as a, as a knob on the front, the ability to control your RF power. And so the third component for transmission control would be to dial back your RF power itself so that even when the signal link and the speakers are putting out more than uh, it should have, the radio itself will not exceed its limits. Very important component. Most people, when they have trouble transmitting, it's most likely because their audio level, their speakers were set too low, and it's not driving the sound card. So something to check it will probably get you on the air when you've processed uh, the information with your sound card and with your uh, signal link or your whatever other interface you're using. I'm not familiar with radios that have the sound card built in. I would assume they have menus that give you the effect of uh, the ability to control levels with, uh, with the, um, in, the, in the radio itself, different from the RX power, I mean TX power, it's actually the sound card level that's being used uh, inside the radio. Okay, we've already went through the little test there. Assuming that you've successfully got your FL Digi receiving signals and putting out a uh, carrier at, at no greater than 50% of your rated power on your radio, we're ready to actually talk about getting on the air to operate. So the first thing you're gonna do is choose the op mode that you're gonna be using for this purpose. The op mode is going to be whatever is typical for the region of the band. There are all these sub bands in, uh, in our frequencies that are being used primarily by hams with certain modes. So today I've dialed up for my live uh, component on the air, uh, 20 meters, the 070, which is operating at, uh, typically uses PSK 31. I was hoping we might see a PSK 63 signal. A lot of the Europeans will use PSK 63, but I don't see one of those today. So put your cursor on a signal and you're decoding, uh, please, Return, that's probably somebody calling CQ. We'll see in a moment if nobody comes back to them. Generally speaking, people operate, uh, uh, they don't operate split, they operate right on. And so he's not copying whoever was trying to call him. See who this, if we get an ID of this particular station. Anyway, uh, we'll come to this thing called macros in a minute because you can set these things up to kind of uh, standardize your communications. When I was first a novice, they taught us, you know, the initial contact, my name, my location, your signal report. The second round, I told you my station, my equipment, my antenna. 
and maybe that was all we did. Same thing can happen here with these kind of modes, and you often have those preset here with your with your uh, with your FL Digi. So they got a French station here. And it looks like he's talking with somebody from England. Time check nine thirty. Okay, thank you very much. Um, other op modes typically being used then for emergency communications on our digital nets here in New Hampshire, we use Thor 22. It's a, it's a very robust mode, um, a narrow mode. On HF, you've got to stay um, below uh, 300 baud, and what's typically obviously less than a, than a voice mode. We'll talk about some of these in a second, what modes are operating. And you select a mode by going to your op mode, dropping down to the type you want and finding its particular variant. I've already mentioned the PSKs, which are often known as BPSKs, and there's a variety of those as well. The, the lower the number, the narrower the bandwidth, the slower the throughput, but the more robust it is. A lot of nets use Olivia 5800, or I'm sorry, 8500. Um, some use MT63. You want to do images, typically MFSK32 is used. Um, these are the common ones. But as I said, this engine is all purpose. If you like radio teletype, you can go with that mode. Um, if you want to explore receiving only, you got weather facts options here as well. So a lot of very interesting possibilities. You'll notice, however, that it doesn't have any of the modes uh, for the um, weak signal modes. That's a separate piece of digital software, the um, WSJTX uh, software for that. So we're, uh, and we're not able to do that with FL Digi at the present time, uh, maybe never. Um, so again, for emergency communications, uh, your net will establish which of these versions it most likely wants to use. And it, uh, as I say, Olivia is common, Thor is common, MT63 is common, and on VHF, uh, some of the faster modes might also be in use. Bring up the next slide here. So what might you choose and why? So as I say, the New Hampshire net uses uh, Thor 22, 78 word per minute. That's a five character word, 78 per minute, 525 uh, Hertz wide. And it's considered a keyboard mode because you can type, a good typist can keep up with the transmission rate. When we have a small image to send, we'll use MFSK 32. As I say, some of the nets use uh, Olivia 8, very robust, but also very slow. <clears throat> and uh, the MT63 is particularly good on uh, VHF. The throughput starts to get, you're allowed brought higher bandwidths and you're allowed much higher word per minute rates. Um, you'll also see what we use on uh, the hospital net is PSK uh, 3 or 4, uh, but 3, 250, 660 words per minute with a bandwidth of about a thousand Hertz. So it's a very robust <clears throat> mode. The rule of thumb is um, HF with all of its issues of fading, QSB, QRM, QRN, uh, you're gonna probably be using a slower mode uh, because uh, yeah, in a narrower mode, so more power gets into the bandwidth and, uh, and you're more likely to not have the code disrupted as badly by those kind of conditions. A good VHF net through a repeater or a solid simplex, um, you're not as limited by baud rate, you're not limited at all by baud rate, and you can go to faster, wider modes uh, and get your signals, get the data transmitted much more quickly. If you go to the manual, the user manual for FL Digi, they have extensive description of all these various modes, far beyond what I'm showing here, and uh, give you more options and choices. Let's look a little bit at the uh, configuration menus. In addition, these are more than operator interest and, and preferences. So it's up here. You would configure and go to the configure dialog. I told you it would look a little different. This was an older version of it, and now they've listed the configure vertically, and they have pop-outs to see. So this would be rig control. <clears throat> you would click on it. there. Slightly more choices. I'm using a tool that they actually produce called FL Rig to control my radio. And uh, 
works very nicely. You just have to set up, in FLRIG, you set up the port controls and so forth. But this is an optional feature, but I will mention it because some people want to know if I could do that. Let me slide this off for a second. The waterfall, uh, just a matter of visual preferences. We go to it, it's uh, found here. The display is typically what you're gonna control. I like to have my, my bandwidth showing on the signal when it comes in, how wide it is. I like a center line on it and, uh, and track my signals. The default colors work for me. This represents signal strength. When you start to get past yellow, you're into the fact that you're driving too hard. You may be getting clipping. You may want to go back into your signal link or your sound control panel. Dial it down a little bit. We like to show our audio frequencies. As I mentioned before, uh, it's typical, uh, especially on VHF nets where voice and data can be on the same frequency. People will say, OK, we're going to the waterfall. I'll meet you at, uh, at 1800. And they're referring then to the bandwidth of the waterfall, which is typically 3000 Hertz. And they're gonna to go to 1800 Hertz is where they're gonna be. The nets that we operate here and in most of New England around uh, New York, <coughs> Maine, Connecticut tend to operate on, the, on 1500, right in the center of a pass band. So they'll tell you their frequency, which is zero. So our New Hampshire net meets on 3582. Well, this is 3582, and our offset or waterfall position is 1500. The net control may then send stations other places. He may say to two stations, uh, would you please move to 2500 and pass your traffic and then return to the net? So a good reason for turning on your audio frequency scales. Um, some people, I myself included, I like to know when I'm transmitting, I still like to see a trace on the waterfall. If you don't click this, the waterfall simply pauses until you come back, it's just a matter of preference. So that's the waterfall control. Uh, again, a matter of personal preferences. Signal IDs, I've talked about TX ID and RX ID. So we go to the ID tab here. When a signal comes in, if the transmitting station has turned on the TX ID, you, and you have your RX ID turned on, you will decode what mode he's gonna be on. And that's useful because it can actually then automatically change the mode on your receiving end to match the mode of the sending station. Uh, for net use, we retain our frequency lock. So whenever we pick up a, a, a TX ID, we aren't gonna change frequency to go to it. If you don't have that clicked, it can be used in, uh, in DX use to actually then find a station and be dragged onto his frequency. It's also possible to get an alert dialog, the little pop-up that says you're receiving a signal somewhere in the passband. I like to disable those. And of course, you can choose to search the whole passband if you want. But for NCOM use, we usually don't because we don't want to run the risk of being pulled off frequency. Notify only just means that you're just going to get a notification that there's a, uh, a station somewhere in the passband generally not needed for emergency communication use. For those of you doing uh, this through repeaters and VHF, you probably want to set up a pre-signal tone. Your system will help you figure out what it is to uh, how long it needs to be, especially if you're using link repeaters, you got to get them all going, uh, fired up and functioning so they don't lose the beginning of your transmissions. So pre-signal tones are useful for that purpose. So that's uh, RXIDs, go forward. Sweet spots, um, just an easy way for your, for your FL Digi to always come up in the right place. Your PSKs and most of your other modes, I believe the program defaults to a thousand on the waterfall. We're mostly use 1500. So just, this is a text box, just type 1500 in, hit save. And you can do the same thing for RIDI and CW if you want. And that way you're, you'll always come up with your transmit uh, tab ready to go at 1500. We'll return to this uh, in the second section. This is connecting FL Digi to FL Message so that when a message comes in, 
it can be automatically decoded and opened up in FL Message program, even if you don't have FL Message running in the first place. So I'm going to come back to this in the next section. And it will involve the program and a little tool called wrap. Um, an operator convenience, FL Digi, can actually launch other programs. So what we use in our net is obviously we're going to be using the message programs, FL Message and FL Amp. I also, as a net control, use Notepad. So I set these up so that when I start FL Digi, it then starts the three of these for me as well. Uh, and the nice thing about Windows is it always puts them right back where I originally had them. You can locate it with this button and it navigates you through your file structure to find where the program is. Obviously, if it's a Windows, it'll have been uh, installed in program files in a folder with its name and it's the exe. Um, you can click test to see if it opens automatically for you. And, and you can choose whether it's enabled or not enabled. You can sometimes have it, sometimes not. You can adjust it at will. And finally, I want to talk about macros. These are very important uh, ways to eliminate a lot of keyboard action if you're not a good typist. A macro is a, a simple text file. It has some codes to it. The typical one is as a TX code, which you find in this directory over here when you're creating a macro. And you simply locate it, highlight it, and click the add it into the macro button. And then in this case, this is a uh, and, uh, New Hampshire Aries, uh, I am ready to receive your message macro. So I will have put the person's call sign here. It will populate here when the macro runs. So WA1EYF, W1EYF, I'm ready to copy your New Hampshire Aries message back to you. And then it puts in my call, which by the way, we put in at the original installation of FL Digi. And then it reverts back to receive and is ready to receive. So these are typical macros. And down here is the, uh, the row of macro buttons. And I happen to be, this particular one is the one called ready to receive. So let me bring back this. So I've got four rows of macros and uh, my New Hampshire Aries macro row is right through here. So here was the ready to receive one. If you right click on it, not left click, left click at, will transmit it. And I don't want to be transmitting that over the air, but uh, there she be, there's the, the TX tab. And I found that originally further down the way here, if I can locate it somewhere and I can't quite remember where it is. There it is. So I, I, when I was ready to go, I went here before this was in place. I'll just take, take it out, highlight, add, and now we're in business. Once you've got your macro set up, you hit apply, and then you close it, and you're ready to go. Let me show you how to uh, do an emergency stop. Uh, I had a daughter who rode horses, and the very first thing on her very first day of riding horses, the very first lesson is how to stop a horse. <laughs> If you inadvertently transmit when you didn't mean to, you want to be able to stop it fast. So let's say I'm in a clear spot here. I have my power way down, by the way, on, uh, so I'm not going to transmit a lot of power. But let's just say I accidentally hit that. And up it goes. And there it's going. You can see it starting to transmit. Right click. And we're down in here, abort. So it's a right click in the blue pane. Right click. Well, now it's not transmitting, so you don't have that option, but it, it gave me the abort function. That's how you do an emergency stop and stopped it right there. And now I can do a clear. So believe me, you won't be the first person who went to edit a macro while you were on the air. <clears throat> and uh, for instance, here's my ending macro. Some days I'm the net, net control station and some days I'm the net logger. So this one macro, I will edit it just before the net, depending. Sometimes I forget and I'll inadvertently go and discover in the middle of the net or just as it gets started, I need to change it to tell people what role I'm playing. 
And I mean to go here and edit it and then uh, accidentally hit left click and start to transmit. So that's the abort function. So as I say, macros come, uh, for those of us in New Hampshire, we've got a, a line of macros. There are four available, four rows available. First row is default. You'll get it with the program. It's some of these over here aren't populated in the original default. And by the way, those can be loaded from a macros. Uh, I'll save the one I did. There's a folder with macros in it. And the original one that comes with the program has only two rows and only partial. And it's meant for uh, contesting in this row and for use by uh, uh, regular QSOs up in this row. As you edit, you can save macro sets. Once you say save, whatever you've done with them is gonna become a new macro. You can save it as a default name or you can give it a new name in the process. So I'm gonna go back to my um, New Hampshire Digital. And that's not the one, which one is it? Okay, I see what I did. I gotta remember my, my strategy. I always call my default one macros. By the way, that the first time you do it, it's called macros. So if you want to keep it, go into your username, FL Digi folder, find your macros folder, and copy and paste that and rename it. I called mine the original. All my others, then the ones I'm currently making my active one, I just call it the regular macros. So I bring that back and I get the, all the ones that I've created. <clears throat> the third row is the New Hampshire Aries and uh, We've been asked, can we put this on website for people to download the macro files, just a bunch of text files. So yes, we can have it available. And then here's my net control line <clears throat> that I use for my digital net. So that's our macro sequence. Um, I just now mentioned where you find them. There is a macros user interface tab and you can control where on your display you set your macros. They can be up high, down low, or in the middle all a matter of personal preference. So with all of that, you should be able to get on the air, begin to use FL Digi initially, maybe just for some PSK31 exchanges with some domestic or DX stations, and, uh, and then uh, begin to monitor some of the nets. If you're in New Hampshire, the New Hampshire training net is every Saturday at 7.30 local. 3582, I do have that listed in the resources at the end of today's workshop. And Steve, I, I can take questions. Are they on the Q&A screen? Yes, they are. If you just bring the Q&A screen, you'll see them all. We've got seven questions so far. Is there a distribution for Raspberry Pi? I believe there is. Um, if you go, to, I, don't, I don't know if we can see it or not. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Let's see if I can, if I go to Dave's site here. Uh, I think Raspberry Pi, there's also, I think, a version for uh, Android phones as well. I think what I would do is, unless you can see something here that works for you, I'm not a Raspberry Pi user, so I, I don't know. What, I'm guessing it would be a Linux distribution of some sort. Uh, but I would uh, send, uh, either join the uh, NBEMS group, uh, NBEMS at groups.io, and ask or uh, or email Dave W one H J K directly, and he would be able to tell you. Uh, Four point one point zero one on my computer. <clears throat> well, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, it depends on, and I'm glad you asked it actually, because this issue of versions with FL Digi is uh, can be a bit of a problem. They are constantly working on updates. I believe the new. I'm on fourteen. The newest one is actually fifteen. So in order that those of us who are commonly communicating with one another, say your NCOM, M MCOM group, may want to decide that for a period of time, <clears throat> you won't be upgrading. You'll all pick a version that's stable and you'll stay on it. So in New Hampshire, we, we do it by quarter. Each quarter of the year, uh, as net manager, uh, I kind of have been monitoring the upgrades to decide if they've got a stable version and unless there's a new stable version, we will stay on, on an older version. Of late, the versions have been pretty stable once they're out. Uh, two, three years ago, a new version would come out and it would be full of bugs. So we got into the habit of waiting. 
The other issue there is will, um, is, is there backward compatibility from the new versions to the older versions? And uh, to be perfectly honest, I would probably come up to 14 in this particular specific answer because it's a very stable version and it has all the latest uh, updates that they've made to the program. I'll mention too that every time you install FL Digi on your computer, uh, you can have multiple versions. So you don't have to uninstall your 01 to install 14 and you'll have a separate uh, desktop shortcut to it. And it has a separate set of configuration files and will operate just fine. Obviously, if you do that too often, you clutter up your, your uh, programs folder. But uh, if you're at all worried, um, upgrade, see how it works before you uninstall uh, the older version. I also keep all my installers in a separate folder over the years. So if I ever need to go back to an older version, uh, I can do that. Laptop won't allow me to download. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is the, some of the, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, virus checker, the virus programs uh, will seem to think that FL Digi is not safe. And the reason not frequently is that so few people have downloaded it. Obviously it's pretty much only the ham community. Um, Dave W1HJK tests these things extensively to make sure there are no viruses in them. If you're ever in doubt, email him direct and ask. But if that's happening, uh, you should be able to either override it. Like my Norton constantly yells at me when I go to the new version. And it turns out it's because so few people have downloaded. And I just then, um, I do have the option to say, run it anyway. I'm taking responsibility. If your uh, uh, virus checker doesn't give you that option, turn it off and then that'll let you download and install. And I generally speaking, unless it's a really super aggressive virus checker, it's not gonna go after it once it's been installed. Signal display, very small, yeah. Uh, Yeah, that is an interesting question. Um, usually, Don, make sure you're, you really are on the right uh, uh, sound card. It almost sounds like, if I can bring up my sound card here, where did I put it? George, could you read the question? Oh, yes. Uh, my signal display shows very small variations. Even though my microphone level is reasonable, signal link is level is reasonable, and the waterfall is blue. What's the issue? Well, you want your waterfall to have speckles in it. Uh, let me both, let me do this. Let me bring up my live. You notice the blue and the speckled yellow, that's what you want to see. Typically then that means you're getting a signal in here. <clears throat> um, if I can bring up the sound here. Um, so I want to go to recording. So you want to make sure you found the right, I don't know how many, uh, 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 microphones you have plugged into your computer. You have the built-in, usually you may have a, like I do here with my uh, video uh, system, I have a, sec a microphone built into the video camera. And then I've got the signal link, which is the USB audio codec. If you've got two or three audio codecs, by the way, it's possible to have multiple radios plugged in with different signal links. Got to choose the right one, um, bring up its properties. So, they do have an advanced tab. Uh, sometimes this one doesn't, but some of them have controls for boost and such. Uh, you might want to do that. Uh, have you tried taking it all the way to the max to see what happens in terms of your, your uh, recording properties there on your input? Signal link, same thing. Um, and I know Signal link, if you go to their website, there's a jumper cable. If your levels, no matter what you can do, cannot get them up to a reasonable level here, like if, if what you're seeing, if what I'm assuming your question is, is that you're seeing something like this, you know, or, or maybe not that bad, but maybe it's like only about like that or like that. Very sensitive here. There, maybe it's like that. Um, the signal link has a jumper you can set, which essentially is a form of internal boost. So. It's, it's described on their website. So you might want to go take a look, bring my level back up. Generally speaking, you set it to the zero dB level and that's a normal signal. Mine's a little low here. So I'm gonna take it a little higher. Oh, there's a nice signal in the pass band now. This is what you really want to see. Beautiful signal within the levels. <clears throat> um, FL Digi supports Vera FM. 
No, it does not, to my knowledge, but um, I probably shouldn't say that. I actually don't know. I use Vera HF, but I use it through, through um, WinLink. I know it's a standalone program, so I don't know. I have to ch I'd have to check the website for support or email uh, Jose and see uh, what he has to say about that. When you refer to a mode as robust, what criteria? <laughs> Good question. Uh, that is obviously a qualitative term. For me, it means that um, most of the time I'm going to get 100% copy of the message being sent. In emergency communications, we want 100% copy. We want it with preferably no need for fills. Digital has that, that advantage, it can do that. Uh, on HF, it's a challenge. You're looking for a mode that will provide 100% uh, copy as often as possible, given the current conditions, which involve QRN, QRM, and fading. So that's my definition of robust. I will mention when we get to it next session that uh, uh, FL message is capable of um, letting you see a message even if it has errors in it, meaning that some of the message did not decode. It depends on your served agency whether you have to ask for repeats of that message or whether they'll accept it and it's considered good enough. Most MCOM work, that's probably not good enough. Uh, typically then on uh, VHF, you don't have to worry about it because normally you're operating the line of sight or through repeaters and the signals are absolutely solid. <clears throat> so unless there's some sort of burst static or your repeater is not antennas wobbly or something, you're gonna get a good signal. So that's my definition of robust. Um, and uh, FL AMP is gonna turn out to be a robust tool because uh, it's designed to not be happy until it has received the message 100% and it reduces the frequency of fills. We'll, we will get to that next session. Ah, yes, uh, it can. I'm not an expert on how to do it, but I've seen on the internet um, and I've seen people on the uh, groups uh, IO uh, getting instruction on how to connect FL Digi to uh, N1MM it, because FL Digi is a all purpose digital communications tool and you can log to it, I'm pretty sure. Absolutely, it runs with Win7. In fact, I've been running Win7 up until uh, three months ago. So I actually preferred on Win7, but I know there are, there are issues with that. When installing the first time, quite a bit of strange characters. Uh, okay, uh, if you mean uh, in, the, in the decode, I don't know if I'm decoding anything or not here. Well, you can see all these, if this is what you're referring to, all these strange characters, it has to do then with your squelch setting. I've turned on squelch, which is why I'm not getting them. If I turn it off, you're gonna get all sorts of information in the passband is gonna be decoded, but it's just gonna be garbage, it's just junk. So it could be as simple as turning on your squelch and then finding out what your level is. So this signal is good and strong if it'll stay there for a minute. Notice as soon as he's up above the squelch, this is the squelch setting then he'll decode Well, he just dropped out. Oh, there's another one, try another one. Again, these are uh, QSOs in progress. So as long as you're getting above, you're gonna get good decode typically, and you're not gonna get the, uh, the noise. As soon as the drops below squelch, you're gonna get noise, if that's what the, uh, what the question was. A comment, there are distributions for the Pi. And this person uh, would recommend watching build a Pi video from Kilo mic for Alpha Charlie Kilo. Kilo mic for Alpha Charlie Kilo. Thank you for that information. Uh, another comment, low signal could be affected by your squelch control. Okay, yep, that's true too. Good point, Dennis. I can't see the questions. Could you please read them? All right, I've, I hope I've been doing that. Uh, please get the question as well as the answer. Okay. Uh, are there more? Is that it, uh, Steve? That, seem, that seems to be it, uh, George. I guess you can move on to the next section if you'd like. Well, let's see here. Can we take a, we have time for a five minute break? Absolutely, why don't we do that? It's uh, just 10 o'clock. Okay, one last question. Is there a reference for the shorthand text codes, for instance, DE and PSE, et cetera? Um, yes, this is the uh, ham lingo. There, Depends on, in the case of digital communications for emergency purposes, there are standard 
pro words, procedural words and things. You can, uh, if you Googled pro words for radiograms, you would get a whole set of uh, words there. Some of these then would come in your basic uh, uh, welcome to ham radio, DE means from. So in, in, an exchange, in a QSO exchange, it's my call sign DE or your call sign DE, my call sign. That means I'm calling you. PSE is one of the versions for please. PLS is another version for please. TU, T, uh, TU, the TNX both mean thank you. You often see those at the end. 73 means greeting or uh, uh, sincerely, sincerely mine, things like that. So let's take five. And when we come back, we'll do the second part with our, our, uh, our, our uh, tools, our um, message handling forms. And thanks for uh, keeping me on time there, Steve. No problem. We'll be back uh, in five minutes.
That's five minutes, George, whenever you're ready. Please turn on your audio. Nothing yet. Okay, can you hear me now? So I can hear you now. Okay. Yep, good old sound cards. <laughs> I've got three running, got to get on the right one. All right. All right, welcome back, everyone. We're going to look uh, first briefly at uh, why NBEMS, which is now going to take us into the narrowband emergency messaging system with messages, as opposed to just having our digital engine. So what is digital communication? Well, it's any information that can be digitized and sent via digital mode. Generally speaking, it's text. Some data is too big to be sent um, and you're gonna have real problems if you try to send video or MP3s or photos that are particularly large. It, it really is optimized for sending radiograms, ICS 213s and the other kinds of text-based information. The reason is that the throughput just isn't uh, capable in most cases. You may have heard some of the more recent disaster communications uh, had to get HF uh, permissions from the FCC to use wider band, higher speed data uh, signal um, uh, baud rates to get information that's not simply text in and out of certain disaster areas. But that's uh, still just a matter of special cases for those of us, we're gonna be dealing with the usual radiogram and ICS-213 kinds of things. So we're gonna be focusing on these smaller file types. For emergency communications, then these digital means are best used for specific directions, lists, names, uh, especially those that might be difficult to spell uh, that don't spell quite the way they sound or are complex, um, medical terms, prescriptions, things of that sort not particularly used for short tactical messages. You wanna be on the microphone for those. Anything that's gonna to be too quick of simple information, again, use the mic and simple status updates, how things are doing. It's generally speaking, transmission of text-based contextual information where you gotta have accuracy and, uh, and reliability. This is a block diagram now of where FL Digi fits into the scheme. We're gonna be looking at two message handling tools, FL Message and FL Amp. They interact with FL Digi in order to convert the text that's in them to uh, uh, AFSK signal, which then goes out through the sound card to the radio. We've already mentioned uh, how we're doing this by way of the signal link. There are rig blasters and others. I didn't mention this before, but FL Digi was originally designed to work in the field with a laptop and a handheld, and you would just hold the laptop, microphone, and speaker up to the same uh, on the computer. It will work that way. Not recommended. You got to have a very quiet environment, but you wouldn't need a, a physical interface if you absolutely didn't have one. Uh, again, it works best in certain emergency situations with HTs, laptops, and in a field setting. It does provide rapid and accurate communications uh, and can be much faster than voice. Uh, getting fills is often easier and you don't have to, uh, theoretically as much of a problem with the spelling of things. Unless you're using certain PACTOR modes, it's not particularly good for images, but this shows some of the conditions that you might be sending uh, information to uh, Red Cross, to the EOC about what's going on out in the field or handling traffic to that effect. And if you think back to your last public service event um, or other activity, you probably passed a lot of traffic that really was just 
you know, useful by way of the microphone. Didn't need to be recorded. Uh, it involved momentary information that people uh, used and, and moved on. The narrowband emergency message system is best used when you want formal messages. Notice the word form informal, and I, I give credit to the forms handling uh, workshop uh, uh, last week. Uh, hadn't thought of the word form being inside the word formal. Whenever you need to have uh, accurate lists, medications, directions, where if you get it wrong, it could be life and death, uh, or certainly life and property at risk. Um, digital communications is, is excellent for that kind of information. And of course, we will ever function in terms of our served agencies and their needs and do what they need. They may well still need voice communication, but there's an increasing need for data. <clears throat> and we constantly see evolution of that in the forms that they use and want us to be using. So those are kind of the primary reasons for we're using uh, emergency communications in a digital format. Let me then uh, bring that back up. That's not happy. Where did it go? Here we go. Excuse me one moment here. Got my PowerPoints set to go. Here, and it thought it was doing a show here. Okay. Resume the slideshow. Let me now end it. Come on. Resume. Why is it not resuming? Excuse me one moment here. Going to have to force a close on this. Okay, going into modes, not navigating. Pardon me one second here. PowerPoint. Number two. Task. All right, there we go. Uh, we should be good to go. Thank you for bearing with me. Murphy, I knew he would show up sooner or later. All right, so the second part of today's workshop specifically has to do with the FL message and the FL AMP tools, which are part of the FL Digi Suite. And there's a behind the scenes program as well called FL Wrap. And our goal for today will be to understand these message forms, to create some messages, send and receive them, and to understand the files and folders where they, they reside. So again, you want to download and install these three tools. Uh, you can find them again at W1HJK or at, uh, at SourceForge. And Just to refresh where we were, if you're just uh, joining us for the second half, this is W1HJK, and I was on his. So FL wrap is here, FL amp is here, FL message would come from here. And again, you see they all have the versions for Linux and Mac and Windows. And likewise, SourceForge. Same thing, uh, going back to the parent folder. We've got uh, FL message, FL amp, and FL wrap. So you wanna download those three and install them. And again, with the exception of wrap, although you can, uh, I, I would uh, make sure you put a desktop shortcut just to be sure you get to it quick and easy. We're gonna start with FL message. It's a really a simple forms management editor. And it has uh, pre-prepared formats so that your information matches uh, what, uh, 
would be the expectation of the served agency, whether it is built in or custom. And when you transfer the data between your computer by way of RF, uh, the other receiving end can interpret the format and properly display it at their end. And we'll be demonstrating that feature. So there are some configurations that one will want to uh, do. Um, for purposes of, uh, of ham radio, you usually go with what's called the expert interface. Uh, don't let the name scare you. All it does is it gives you full control of the program, especially its forms. It's not set to user when a served agency wants you to only use certain forms and they've pre-populated it with only those forms and then you turn that off and there's no confusion about what forms you're gonna have access to. But other than that, it's what it means is that uh, you have full access to all the different forms that would be available in the program. Personal information, again, it wants, uh, doesn't hurt to put in your name and your call sign and your location. Files are saved with date and timestamps and the served agency may have preferences for that. If not, you can use your own preference. When you save a file, you have some options, whether or not a call sign, a serial number, date and time are included in the file name. You can also decide the, the length of your characters, depending on what might print out on whatever printer you're using, should you have one connected to your system. Radiograms can be sent to a standardized five words per line, and you can have auto increment of your radiogram messages if you want a good way to not have to think about what the number of the message is. And this may also show you the ARL, you know, expansions of ARL code numbers. And probably of all the things, this is the most important, and that's the ARQ uh, interface between FL message and FL digi. You want to enable your, your, your um, RxID, which is why in FL digi, you really want the TXID turned on because this allows uh, FL message on the receiving end to, to synchronize, and that's what you would set here, its modem to the FL Digi. So when FL Digi sends a preliminary piece of information, it says I'm using Thor 22. If this button is checked, the FL message will say, okay, Thor 22, and no matter what modem it had been set to, it will change to modem Thor 22. A key resource setting for this particular program. So now you should be ready to go with the thing. It's a matter of, of picking out the form you're gonna be using for the served agency. Of course, a very common one from the forms dropdown are the ICS forms and the ICS 213 is very common. So let me demonstrate an exchange of that uh, for our purposes here. Let's bring up, so here's uh, FL Digi. And here is FL message. And we're using a ICS 213 form pre-populated for this demonstration. There's an in, uh, incident name uh, to whom it's intended to go, possibly with their position at the receiving end. Who is sending it? In this case, I'm the sender, but I mean, obviously this would be whoever at the served agency has authorization to send this message and their position and then the date and time, the message would populate in here. I'm just putting in a, a placeholder that we can send. And then uh, uh, again, if there's a possibility of interaction between this, some put the originator, meaning the authorized person here and the ham here and other people as we have done here, have reversed it where this is the author. Um, that's what I've done here. Other times the ham is the one here and the authorizing person is here. You wanna know what your MCOM group wants to do or more importantly, what your served agency wants to do. Because of the RAP program, which is running behind the scenes, when I initiate this transmission, it's going to wrap this in a header and a footer, which is gonna tell the receiving program what it is it's looking at as it comes into the other computer by way of the RF or in today's demonstration, by some cables that are emulating RF. And we'll see the message begin to go out from here to the receiving end. I wanna get on the right frequency, 1500 on the waterfall. And I wanna lock it, so let's stay there. 
I'm going to make sure I'm in the same place on my received computer. Stand by one moment. And lock that. OK. So if all goes well, when I'm ready to transmit this message, with FL Digi, we've probably gone through that handshake here where I've called the station. And he tells me he's ready to receive. And so I'm going to click auto send. You get the little pre tone. The TX ID is triggering. And then there goes the message. And you can see it has the wrap header on it. And sends out the preamble. And then the uh, signature, and then finally, the data itself is being sent on to the receiving station. Okay, if all has gone well, the station at the other end is going to respond to me that he received the message okay, and do I have another message? He will have used his macros for that purpose. So for instance, I would hope to see that I get this exchange back. Okay. Uh, the call signs aren't quite right here because um, these are both my computers and they were both preset to my call sign. But in essence, uh, this one's treating my demonstration computer as if I was Steve. All right. And then I would handshake with him as, as appropriate. Perhaps the message required a reply of some sort in which case the receiving station could type in a, a date and a time. There is a tab, as you'll see there, for a responder. Sorry, I'm off screen here just a little bit, but let's see here, we have a quick reply. That's why I like macros. This is just a, a demo, okay? And we will once again have the handshake. Uh, I have a message for you, are you ready to receive? I say, yes, I am. And the station sends its message back to me, this time with their reply. And as is uh, customary in, in MCOM use, uh, the original message is part of the reply. So we know what the reply is replying to. <clears throat> so we're going to see the initially the same information, and then we're going to see the respondents component at the end. And I neglected to put in the respondents uh, information. It should have had name and position. So on the reply, got it. They will comply. There are then a variety of forms available for the different uses, um, ICS forms. There is a plain text form just uh, for general purposes. Of course, we have the radiogram form with the standard headers. We have hospital forms, which have variants on. And so they are a little more complex. They have multiple tabs. Uh, and multiple exchanges may occur, so they've got the option to read receipt uh, twice over and then each time reuse. So uh, complex forms, depending on your served agencies. There's also the option to create custom forms and the American Red Cross, for instance, has created a set of custom forms. So here's their American Red Cross safe and well form. It's a little bit of advanced a feature, but basically in order to use this form, you have to edit it in a browser, submit it back, and then transmit it. And uh, we'll, we would take that up in a more advanced thing, but uh, it's not a complex thing to do. It just uses, rather than this window, to fill in the information, you fill it in in a browser. I wanna show one other thing about the receiving end of things. Let me go back to my ICS 213. Okay. We'll look at the config uh, menu here on FL Digi. 
And you'll recall in the FL Digi workshop, I mentioned that there is an interaction under the miscellaneous tab with MBEMS. So you can enable the interface between FL Digi and FL Message. And that means that when an FL message is being received, if you've told FL Digi where in your computer FL message has been installed, which is typically program files x86, FL message and its version number, and then FL message.exe. And if you're not sure, you can use this tab to go find it. It will open the message automatically in FL message and it will open it in a browser as well, which makes it a little prettier and oftentimes easier to print. So I've got that set up. Let me see if we can demonstrate that. Close that for a moment. And go back here to my FL message and see if in fact it will activate that for me. I expected it to do it before, but it didn't. So I'm not quite sure why it did not do that, but oh, I take it back. It did. Uh, where is it? There it is. Okay. So that message that had the reply when it came in, I had that already set to not only automatically open FL message, but to uh, pass it to a browser and to and to format it in a very nice form looking fashion that served agencies often like to see. This can be printed and kept in their files for future reference. I'm gonna close that, minimize that, and actually this time send it again. And notice I don't have FL message open. So all goes well, it's going to uh, decode the message. And then because of my preference setting in FL Digi, it's gonna automatically open FL message. Just let it come in here. And then following this, I'm gonna show how it functions when it gets a second message and a couple of the options you have with respect to that kind of option. And there we go. Open both in a browser, nicely printed capability. And of course it opened up here. So now I'm gonna send a second message. Give me a moment here to queue it up. All right. So here we go. So I've just received the first message. I'm the EOC, in comes another message from another one of our uh, groups in the field. And just bear with me, because this is important. You have a couple of options, I'm gonna show you both. And then it'll be a matter of your served agency and or your MCOM group as to which version they which way they like to go when it comes to receiving multiple messages so it opened in the browser but it doesn't look like it opened here so we want to go to under utilities received messages and well I was expecting to see my second message showing under my received message tab, but I've not seen it. So therefore it's hiding somewhere else, probably on my dashboard. Yep, sure enough, there it is. There's number two. And I'm guessing it was directly behind it. These are the little things you've got to get used to with the program and how it's going to behave on your computer. And believe me, it's not the first time it's easy to get tripped up uh, and looking down in the and I don't have it on this display, but looking down in the taskbar, I was able to see that I had a second message. Obviously, each message that comes in opens another window. And this can, in an active emergency situation, fill up the screen very, very quickly. So on your FL Digi interface with FL message, 
you have an option called transfer direct to executing FL message. When I click that option and then save it, and I'm going to close this message. Let me bring up uh, yet another message. So it looked like we're starting to get a lot of messages. We don't want to take up all of our computer real estate. So we've asked the program to send future messages uh, to the current FL message, that is display window. It doesn't overwrite it, it just replaces it. The other one still exists. So this is our third message coming in. And we'll see what happens when it finishes. And you see it pops up a menu, <coughs> um, an index. So we have the original message and then we have the received message. I'm gonna point out what I consider to be a little bit of a bug. When I click on this, it's gonna populate this field with this information. And I'm not certain whether or not I think my original will stay, but I'm not always positive that it's going to do that. So there's the original, there's the index. Definitely want to save these as soon as you receive them, just in case. So I'm going to highlight it, click view. And so it's now populated my message. But it didn't record that I had the first one in there. And it doesn't, to my knowledge, even the first time you do this, and I'm wondering if it still exists. And the answer is no, it does not. So rule of thumb, when you received a message, file, save or save as, I use save as. Remember we configured how we want the message to look, a call sign, a date, a time, and then you would save your message. And that way you can retrieve a message at any given time uh, by simply going to file, open, and you can see the messages that have shown up. And these are all things you don't need to know about in terms of where they are. They're of course shown in the path name here in case you do wanna know, but the program is, is optimized to always go where it's supposed to go. So I can bring back that message number one if I had it saved. So two different ways to handle uh, receiving multiple messages. One of our, will create additional windows and this one creates simply a index of received messages and only uses a single window to display them at any given time. They do, however, populate um, separate. Every time you get a message, it will put it on its own, its own screen. And you can send it there if you want. So let me close that down. So that's pretty much FL message. As I say, again, to summarize, FL message is a forms handling editor comes pre-populated with a variety of standard forms. And in many cases nowadays, especially the Red Cross has provided to MCOM groups, all of their custom forms. And you can place those in custom folders and have all the forms they wanna use. If it's a different served agency, they may well have their own forms that you would use as well. And possibly depending on the served agency, they may decide that they only want you to use their forms in the custom folder and therefore they would unclick being an expert and not give you access to all your forms. You would only have the ones that they put in the custom folder. So that is FL message. I wanna go on to FL AMP just to make sure we have time to cover it. And then I'll take questions on both sets of tools uh, at the end of this session. Let me move on here. So FL AMP is an amateur multicast protocol. It will transmit one or more files and it allows iteration of fills rather than having to repeat the whole message. In the case of FL message, if there had been an error anywhere in the message, you would have had to repeat the whole message to get it accurate. In the case of FL AMP, it's gonna break the transmission into blocks and the receiving station, if it misses a block, can request just that one block to be sent. And we'll try to demonstrate that this morning. 
So FL AMP, you install it like you've done the other tools, make sure you have a desktop um, shortcut in my opinion. And the first thing we'll do is we'll wanna configure it. Again, you want to sync it either way in this case, because FL AMP is, an act, is actually originating messages you've already created and are simply taking the files and placing them in an, a, a transmit buffer. Uh, it's possible that you'll have decided to switch the mode in the FL AMP tool rather than the FL Digi tool. So these two interact and they make sure that you're always transmitting with the same mode, regardless of which program set the mode. And then you wanna make the change just before you transmit. Uh, FL message has no way to deal with repeaters in their, in their timeouts. So it has a, an indication of how long the message will take. You need to know your repeater timeout or get the sysop to turn it off during an emergency. FL AMP can actually handle repeater timeouts. Uh, if you know how long it goes before it resets in, in whole minute increments, you can transmit, pause, let it drop long enough for the repeater to reset. That's how you set it here. And then it picks up again. So it, it works nicely through repeaters. So it has a couple of advantages. The block method, which reduces iterations for fills and the fact that it can work through repeaters. So this is the receive tab and this is the transmit tab. And we're gonna demonstrate both of those. So let me bring up my FL Digi again and my FL AMP. And do the same on my computer. So we'll start with a message to be received. So with FL AMP, receive tab here, as the message comes in, we'll get a preamble, <clears throat> file, name, date, time. Uh, pardon me a second. If the transmitting station has given it a description, they will. And then it's gonna tell us about how big the file is, how many blocks it's created, how the size of each block, and the data as it starts to fill in will come in here. Later, depending on how well we did with the reception, uh, we'll be able to determine whether we've missed any blocks or not. So we should be set to receive here. On the transmit tab and So again, I've not said it because it just would be repetitive, but obviously before each of these messages gets sent, the stations have, hand have had a handshake with each other, making sure that they're ready to receive, that they know which location on the waterfall and what mode they're gonna be using. <clears throat> now, unlike FL message, FL AMP has to be activated, launched before it will work, but you launch it after FL Digi. Just a little wrinkle, FL Digi, then FL AMP. FL Message, if you've set that NBEMS uh, inter interface with FL Digi, doesn't have to be open ahead of time, but FL AMP does. So as the message come in, we picked up the preamble, 369 bytes, six blocks. And as the blocks are successfully received, they fill in along this blocks line. Obviously the block size changes to match however many blocks you're gonna be expecting to receive. So there were six here, one, two, three, four, five, six blocks. It was a ICS 213 form, which is why it appears encoded here because it was actually wrapped. Had you sent it on FL message, it would have been a wrapped file. So it is somewhat obscured, but then notice it's being decoded here in the decode window. And you can see it's message number four. And when you save it, it saves as an ICS 213 and FL message can be used to open it and view the message and even send it on as an FL message if you wanted to do that. So what I wanna do now is show what happens uh, if the message coming in is disrupted and how then you can do uh, uh, very simple and easy fills. Let me find my sound. Where did my sound go? Did I turn it off? I might have. Let me bring it up again. Uh, 
And let's see, so I'm going to be recording. Bring it over here. All right. And I'm on the Logitech headset. I'm looking at my properties. Okay. And I need to do this because I'm going to simulate uh, fading on, on, in, an, in an HF situation. So. Here we go. So a message is coming in. Now notice it automatically knows another message that creates a new line for it. It's message number five. We're getting the preamble. It's going to have six blocks. There's block one. Block two. Uh oh, signal fade. Signal comes back. And we should have been down here to see what's happening. And end of transmission. And look, we're missing blocks three and four. So they were lost in the fade. Well, rather than having to retransmit the whole message, <clears throat> I can issue a report. It gives me a warning. Are you about to transmit? I'm going to say yes. And it's going to tell the sending station which blocks I did not get. And at that end of the line, that station can then, in their transmit tab, can type their block numbers in there and send only three and four. So I need three and four. And we will retransmit. And notice it jumps straight to blo uh, data block three and data block four. So rather than uh, having to go through this whole message all over again, as we would with FL message, we're able to fill in just the uh, blocks in question. Once you have it 100 percent, there are no errors. It was received completely accurately, and you can be sure to use it. I recommend on HF nets that FLAMP is more robust. There's my qualitative definition again, primarily because it's easier and takes less time to get the message across. You don't have to do complete repeats, only have to repeat pieces that somebody missed. It's much more like a voice net, just doing fills for words and phrases that were missed rather than having to repeat the whole session. The transmit tab looks like this. It has a drag and drop function. So if your messages are pre-queued and ready to go, they're very easy to bring up. Let me bring that back. Where's my FL amp? There's my FL amp. And there's my FL digi. Yep, wrong thing. There it is. OK. And I can drag over a file. So here's a sit rep that I want to transmit. Who do I want to send it to? WA1EYF. Uh, it's the weather report from this end. And it's going to be, um, I'm going to send the header once. It's only going to repeat once. You have options. Obviously, if you have the time, you can send your header twice, which improves reliability. As long as the preamble comes through, they'll know how many blocks to be receiving. <clears throat> Sometimes if you have time, you can actually send the message more than once, and it will automatically fill missing blocks without having to have the receiving station tell you. I'm going to use PSK250R. 
This message is 560 bytes long, 38 seconds with this mode, and it'll come in four blocks. When you're ready to go, you hit TX. If you have multiple files queued up, which you can do, you can hit XMIT all, and they'll all go at once. If you put in the wrong file, you can remove it. You can also add by looking through a dialog box to find out where a file might be on your computer. I just had mine queued up on the desktop and was able to drag and drop it right into place. So a transmit, as you would expect, is gonna look a lot like the receive, except obviously it's in red and it's outgoing. So it sends out the preamble and then the, the uh, four data blocks. This is a text file. So it's actually then in plain text as it's transmitted, it's not wrapped as it was with the other message, which somewhat obscures the information in terms of its plain textness. Doesn't obscure, obscure it when you have the proper tools to, uh, to decode it. And at the other end, it was received. And if they had any kind of problem, they could tell me. But they didn't, so it, we're all set in that respect. So that's FL AMP, a very nice tool. I think it's very reliably used on HF because it shortens the need for fill exchanges and highly recommend it for that purpose. So at this time, Steve, I'm ready to open up questions here. And see okay. what Dave made a comment at the very beginning of the questions that are left. Okay. Um, so is that what you're showing me? What are the advantages of FL Digi MBS over WinLink for MCOMs? Well, that's uh if that is that the first question I'm looking at? You, you go go ahead with that one. Okay, I'm sorry because if I've not scrolled to the proper well, let me take that question first. Well, that's a matter of opinion, you know. Uh, you like a Mac computer or a PC. They each have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, WinLink clearly is email and uh, that's becoming a very commonly understood form of communication. And a lot of served agencies would like to be sending emails back and forth. It does have both broad, uh, um, uh, store and fetch. It also has point to point and it even has station to station. So it's got a lot of, and it has radio only. So it's, <laughs> it's robust in the sense that it is hardened. It is capable of being done strictly by radio and never using the internet at all. The internet may be considered a weak link in, uh, uh, in WinLink because most of the transmissions of course are going to a gateway station, which then routes it out to all this, the common message servers for the message to be picked up later um, by a station, again, uh, either by radio or by uh, telnet, which is the internet. The message handlers with lots of experience are not comfortable as much with WinLink email messages because they do not contain in their headers adequate information that helps you know if you've got an accurate message at the other end. You don't have a word count. You don't have handling instructions, a variety of things that are not there in the radiogram or radiogram type messages. Even the ICS 213 is not always, you're not always comfortable with because it lacks those kind of error corrections at the macro level. So it boils down to um, uh, how you feel about it. MBEMS uh, is over the air. So it, it, while you can take and use FL message, to create a, a, a ICS-213, say, or a radiogram, and save it as a text file, and then add it, attach it to an email message, it could be sent over the internet. But its primary purpose is strictly radio, whereas WinLink is a much more hybrid system. So that's my take on it. Um, others, I'm sure, may tell you differently. Uh, so what's my first question there, Steve? Did you see, can you see Dave's comment at the top? Oh, there? Uh, when you get to custom forms, I've put the ARC forms into the custom, but when I try to access one, I get the work. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about that, Dave. Uh, somehow, 
your, uh, um, you put them in, have you restarted FL message so that it is re-looking at that form? I don't know that I've seen that error message before. It seems as though your FL message, you I, I don't know how many instances and versions of FL um, message you have on your computer. It's in your NBEMS folder in the custom forms, but if you have multiple installations, you may have put it in the wrong one. So you may be on version 14 or no, I'm sorry, version five, and you may have put it in the custom folder for version four. But after this workshop, I'll try to see if I can duplicate the problem and then uh, get to you offline. Um, how will the received message get to the message form for printing? Uh, if you're referring to how it gets to um, here, this is a setting in the FL Digi uh, menu. So if that's what you meant, you would be in your configure FL message, miscellaneous SNB EMS interface, and you want to open it in a browser. That's how it got here. Now, obviously printing it is a matter then of your computer has to be connected to a printer. Otherwise, uh, you're not gonna be able to print this. If, however, what you're asking is, um, if I can bring up my FL, if I have one still there, okay. How do you print this? Well, um, I don't believe there's a print utility built into it. What you do is you, you can view it for HTML delivery. So let me just demonstrate that. I probably should have shown that when I was doing that before, okay. So hold on a second, I've got that ready to go. If I um, am in FL message and I go file, view, HTML delivery, then you see I had erased it over here. So this is the only tab I have and that, that now it's here. So that's how you get it into your browser for printing. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to simply save the uh, form, which you should have done anyway. I'm just gonna use save as so you can see where it goes. So it goes, this is my computer user name and it's been placed in my C drive, in my username, in the nbems.files folder, in the ICS messages folder. And uh, were I to save it, which I just did, okay. Now I can go there, just navigate with a text editor, let's say notepad. Bring up notepad and I can uh, open it, which means I have to navigate to it. So I've got to find my way there. So it's in my username, in my NBEMS, in my ICS messages, thought it was, okay, it must be in a different file. Is it in this one perhaps? Oh, I, up, oh, up. <laughs> oh boy, yep. Tripped up by the oldest problem in the book when you're looking for something, <laughs> you gotta tell it what it's looking for. Okay, there we go. And uh, so here's message one and you open it. But you notice it's not as pretty. So a lot of sort of agencies wouldn't like it that way. Um, I don't know of any other way to print it, to be perfectly honest with you. I don't normally print them, so uh, just keep them on file. But this has all the information uh, that would have been expected in that particular message, as well as in this case, the reply message that we had from before. Um, is there use of JSA call? There are some NCOM group, uh, people don't know what JS8 call is. It's a weak signal mode adapted for uh, chat um, or even QSO, uh, rag choose, and um, operates in the, just above the WSJTX region. So it'd be around uh, like on 20 meters, it's 14076. And you'll see these, what appear to be FT8 signals, but in fact, they're actually 
people rag chewing. It's got some automatic logging features. So as stations come on, they can be automatically placed in a list. <clears throat> so I have heard of, of people using it for MCOM purposes for doing the check-in for their net. But uh, it, it raises the issue then of where you're gonna hold the data exchange portion of your net because it normally isn't where you would then be exchanging your your uh, FL message or your FL amp messages. So you're probably working with multiple frequencies. That said, of course, uh, in New Hampshire, the digital net is a subnet to the voice net and the net control station is informed that people have a digital message to send to some other location or to EOC. And he sends the two stations down to the uh, 3582 uh, in order to exchange the message and then come back. So the net doesn't operate independently of the voice net. I suppose you're doing essentially the same thing with this. Uh, TCP IP over packet, not sure about that. I, I can't answer that question, unfortunately. So the reason to use that is for error correction. Uh, yes, it exactly. It's essentially a way to reduce the time needed to receive accurately because it breaks the message up into chunks. The equivalent would be on a voice net. If you're sending a long voice message, they often use a, what's called a um, stop and go. Whereas uh, I would read a line, I'd read five words and then I would say stop. And if you got it right and didn't need a fill, you would say go. And if I say stop and you need something, you say fill. So that way you have broken the message into five word groups as you go down. That's essentially what FLAMP is doing. It's just breaking it into 64 uh, byte chunks. And then if you need fills, it tells you which ones you got and which ones you didn't because of the error correction. The, the, you can tell the transmitting station which blocks you need. It, ra it allows longer messages to be throughput in less time. You don't have to resend the whole message. Why not use fetch? Um, oh, okay. Fetch is a feature for the transmitting station when he's received or she's received a report back from a station that indicates some missed blocks. You can click on a button on the transmit tab called fetch and it will automatically look at the trans at the receive buffer and decode which blocks were missed. Um, I've not used it in a while. It used to be a little bit clunky and didn't always catch all the blocks, but it's certainly a, a nice tool when it's working. <clears throat> and I expect uh, if you're not getting too many uh, uh, requests for fills, it would be a good way to go. And it might also make it faster. I find it's just easier as somebody's sending me a, a, a report to at, on the fly, I just type in the missing blocks. You seem to have a way of FLAMP sending formatted messages. Okay, uh, FL AMP will send any file you, you drop into the transmit buffer. So if I'm on my transmit buffer. So again, keep in mind, the, the, the throughput is not great. You've got to keep your files real simple. Text is based, CSV files for spreadsheets, keep, but the smaller, the better. See, here's 500 bytes and it still took over half a minute. But any file you want can be dropped in or added into this list and the FL AMP will try to send it, okay? Um, at the other end, it doesn't care what it is, it will receive it and then as a received file, okay? So let's say this was something other than a 513, maybe it had a DOC or DOCX, so it was a, a Word document. Uh, you would highlight it and just say, uh, I'm sorry, uh, save has a save button. You would highlight it and you click the save button and you would decide where to save it. It would save with its uh, extension. And then you would go and you would open it with whatever program it was intended. So it was a CSV file. You either double click on it after you save it or go get Excel and go find it and open it that way. So they can, uh, they can work. Um, Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yes, the recording is gonna be available. Steve will tell us all about that in a couple of minutes. Um, I know you can't see the questions. I, I've gotta to try to read them. And they're telling us, Steve, that it would be good. And this is feedback for the organizers. It'd be nice if everybody could see the questions. 
if there's a problem with WinLink, will NBS still be in service? Absolutely. It's as long as there are two hams with this with these uh, with this hardware and software, they can be sending messages back and forth to each other. Uh, and that is one of the advantages of NBMS. It's independent. It's radio only. Thank you, uh, uh, KC2ENS. Appreciate that. And uh, again, asking about printing the form for the 213. Um, yeah, printing, I think, is something they ought to work on. Um, other than having it go into the browser and print from there <clears throat> in a pretty you know, looking nice form, uh, the uh, text message doesn't print very well. Let's see if I got anything else here. Um, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Al and Steve. It looks like we're done. Okay. Well, thank you very much, George, and uh, thank you for your, all your comments, particularly on the the issues that we might have had during there. I had thought everyone could see the Q and A by clicking on the Q and A button, but we will take a look at that. And please be assured that all the presenters and producers would get together with the the folks that are running the, this, and we'll make sure we tweak this for the next time we do it. Um, thank again. Thank you, George. And pleasure. This point, My pleasure. Uh, this concludes this, this session of the 2020 HAM Exposition New England Aries Academy Series. Remember to register for future session at hamexposition.org. Thank you very much and thank you for attending.